Welcome to our Good Friday service as we come together to meditate on the cross and to meditate on Jesus on that cross. This service today is a, a joint effort by the Manistique Ministerial Association. It's a partnership of the local churches and we do various ecumenical services together throughout the year as well as provide emergency aid within the community and with the transient population, especially in the summertime. Um, if you feel a desire to contribute financially to the work of the Manistique Ministerial Association, you can do so. There's an offering plate by the door there and you are, are welcome to contribute in that way. Uh, and I also wanna give just one note. So Good Friday is a somber time, right? It's a solemn service. So I will ask as we leave at the conclusion, if you can leave the space we're in quietly, you know, we can meet elsewhere to, to talk and, and gather as desired, but to respect the solemnity of the time that we are sharing together. If you'll take your order of service and we'll follow along, the hymns that we will be singing are all in the hymnals. So you'll find the words there. Join me now in a reading on the cross-shaped love. Come, let us gather again in the shadow of the cross of Christ. We gather to remember the overwhelming evidence of love's ultimate sacrifice. Who would have guessed that the height and depth, the length and width of God's love might look like this? a forsaken savior on a cross. Certainly not us, not us who are so thin lost among the world's distractions and responsibilities, not us for whom such love was offered without cost. Let us gather again in the shadow of the cross of Christ and commit ourselves to remember the price paid let us live our lives in a way that indicates why this Friday is called good. Thanks be to God who opened the gates of heaven that we might have the faith, hope, and love witnessed in Christ's sacrifice for our salvation. Father God, we pray that you would guide our hearts now to the cross to embrace the despair that we find there and in the despair to find the deepest hope and love ever displayed in this universe. Guide us to your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.
A reading from the first message for the nail of injustice is taken from the Gospel of John, the first chapter, verses 9 through 11, and the Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter, verses 39 through 43. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was going to come into the world, but although the world was made through him. The world didn't recognize him when he came. Even in his own land and among his own people, he was not accepted. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you are dying? We deserve to die for our evil deeds, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On the Christian calendar, Good Friday marks the darkest day. However, it is also our call to action. It is our response that death does not have the final word. In our society, our sense of injustice is incredibly fine-tuned. When we are wronged, even in the smallest of ways, we are quick to respond with shock, anger, and emotion. We have seen just how radical Jesus' life has been. He has sought out the lost, welcomed in the sinners, healed the sick, and overcome evil. Jesus was the most amazing man who ever lived, and yet the religious leaders of his day hated him and conspired to kill him in what is the worst act of injustice ever perpetrated against a person. But as we look at the unjust trial and sentencing of Jesus, we ask the greatest wonder of all, what is truth? There's a question that strikes at injustice that unfolds on Good Friday. It is that famous question that Pilate asks that stares us in the face every year on Good Friday. The fact that it seemingly is left unanswered remains a challenge to us. Jesus doesn't seem very interested in verbally defining truth. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus says that he came into the world to testify to the truth and that those who belong to the truth listen to him. But he never gives a philosophical definition of the truth. Jesus seems less interested in defining the truth and much more interested in instead showing us the truth. He's interested in having us see the truth as a living thing and to see ourselves as belonging to it, as being a part of it. But being human means we have multiple truth claims weighing on us. The truth of the world, the way it is, and the truth of God's realm, the way God dreams the world to be, the way we believe it can be. Those multiple claims are at the root of Pilate's question. What is truth, or maybe which truth do you mean? But Jesus doesn't respond in words to Pilate's question. Instead, he reveals the answer with his life, death, and resurrection. The passion reveals a deep truth about the way the world is. Not the world that God created and pronounced good, but the world that we have created. The world we have made out of fear, out of shame, out of bitterness out of our desperate need to hide our own tender wounds. In our desperation and fear, we try to make it somebody else's fault. We cast blame and we cry out for the blood of someone else, an innocent over and over and over. The passion reveals the worst in us. It reveals the truth of the hideous things we're capable of when when we are afraid, when we're ashamed. Of course, it reveals an even even deeper truth about who God is and how God responds to our our shame and fear. The truth that Jesus shows with his life and ministry is a profound challenge to the world we have made. The truth that Jesus shows us is that 
no matter how benign and beneficial we might think our human systems and structures are, they all fall. We all fall. Our world is infected with injustice. Jesus demonstrated with his life, with his teachings, and with his death the truth about this infectious injustice. And the human cost that is always required for maintaining unjust structures of power. All through his life and his death, he shows us God's loud no to the dominant systems of this world. And God's louder yes to the way of God's hope, God's peace, and God's justice. These are truths that we can see with the help of the cross. If we have eyes to see and ears to hear, Pilate has a chance to see these truths as well. He is the local representative of the dominant system at that time. And in this conversation with Jesus, he has a chance to hear and see and be transformed. But Pilate can only see the world in terms of earthly kings. So he turns away from the revelation, the revelation of the truth standing before him. And once the crowd reasserts their commitment to the status quo, loudly affirming they have no king but Caesar, Pilate turns away and goes back to business as usual. And once Jesus is nailed to the cross, the crowd, no longer interested in the spectacle of the moment, they also turn away and go back to their lives, their business as usual. All four of the gospel accounts of these events have significant and subtle differences. In John's version, there are no earthquakes, no darkness covering the earth, no temple curtains being torn in two. In John, Jesus simply dies on the cross and is put in a tomb. The empire doesn't strike back so much as it continues on. People return to their lives of luxury and labor. The status quo remains the status quo unchallenged. How often do we catch a glimpse of this life-giving, world-altering truth and then go back to business as usual? How tempting is it for us to just turn away and to not look at or accept this truth? The truth is that we are capable of this horror, that the passion takes place because the world we have made, the world we are content to live in every day, we are constantly at risk of turning away turning away from the cross of Christ and turning away from all the crucified people of every generation and returning to that status quo. It's so very easy to close our eyes, to change the channel, to turn the page and walk away telling ourselves that the reality, the truth of the cross doesn't really have anything to do with us 2,000 years later. What is truth? But in hiding our eyes from that truth, we risk missing an opportunity for transformation that God is always holding out for us. The first act in repentance, the first move toward redemption, the first stance in transformation is simply not to turn away, to not close our eyes to the suffering of others in the moment of injustice. It roots us firmly in the truth the truth revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the truth that God's dream is greater than the world's nightmare, the truth that God's yes is deeper and more profound than the empire's no. It is when we face reality, when we face the truth, when we bear witness to the suffering of Jesus and the suffering of all the crucified people around the world, that is when salvation and redemption begins. It cannot be a coincidence that the first people who see Jesus on Sunday morning are the same ones who refuse to look away from his death on Good Friday. Those who watch through the whole bloody execution, who accompany the body to the tomb, who come again to prepare his lifeless corpse for burial, they are the ones who are the first to experience the truth of resurrection, the truth of Jesus' life, the truth of God's yes. The cross reveals that truth. The truth of the pain and suffering that co continues to exist in the world because of the inhuman demands on our unjust systems and structures. But also the truth that for those who are willing to join themselves to a community that continues to look 
on the cross and strives to stand in solidarity with those who are hurting, who are marginalized, who are still being sacrificed, crucified every day. The cross also opens up a way of transformation and salvation. May we be given the strength to never turn away from the cross and to live more fully into that truth, the way and the life as revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Listen now to the word of our Lord. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of law. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the one who is righteous will live by faith. But the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And in the Gospel of Matthew, we read from chapter 27, verse 45. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. This is the word of the Lord. The nail of God's curse. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me on that day when the sun refused to shine. The words in Paul's letter to the church at Galatia have been called the Magna Carta of Christian Liberty and the Christian Declaration of Independence. Paul's salutation is harsh. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Even though they had witnessed Christ's crucifixion, they continued clinging to the law in hope, clinging to the law that required total adherence, the law that would destroy the freedom, unity, and mission to which God had called them in Christ. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. This afternoon, we remember the curse of that dark day. We stand in awe of his amazing grace, the extravagant cost, and incomparable love. How can we comprehend the enormity of such sacrifice? We see the cross, the crown of thorns, the nails driven into his hands and feet, cursed 
despised, rejected, bearing the burden of our sin on that tree. We see our sins and our guilt. In return, we have received amazing grace. Frederick Buechner spoke eloquently of this when he wrote, Grace is something you can never get, but can only be given. There is no way to earn it, deserve it, or bring it about any more that you can deserve the taste of fresh raspberries and cream, or earn good looks or bring about your own birth. He said, here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It's for you I created the universe. I love you. There is only one catch, like any other gift. The gift of grace can only be yours if you reach out and take it. Let us join in the responsive prayer. Before the cross, we kneel and see the heinousness of our sin. Show us the enormity of our guilt by the crown of thorns, the pierced hands and feet, the bruised body, the dying cries. A reading from Isaiah chapter 53. Yet you bore our illnesses and carried our suffering. We thought you were being punished, struck down by God and brought low, but it was for our offenses that you were pierced, for our sins that you were crushed. Upon you lines lies a chastening that brings us wholeness. And through your wounds, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us goes our own way, but the Lord has laid upon you the guilt of us all. Word of God, word of life. A reading from Colossians. And though you were dead in sin and did not have the covenant, God gave you new life in company with Christ, pardoning all our sins. God has canceled the massive debt that stood against us with all its hostile claims, taking it out of the way and nailing it to the cross. In this way, God disarmed the principalities and the powers and made public display of them, after having triumphed over them at the cross. Word of God, word of life. Grace and peace be unto you from God, our parent, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. With this next nail comes judgment. Now God does not judge as we judge. What is it that you abhor? What is it that you hate? And what do you think is bad? Well, I'm sure if we made a list of all of the good things in the world, it would not be diseases, being stricken and bruised, wounded and infirm. By our judgment, suffering and infirmity are always to be rejected, and there is nothing we should desire in them. But God is not so quick to cast off things as we are. 
God, whose starting material for creating the universe was a formless void, does not shy away from death on a cross, as this too is good starting material. Indeed, as it says in Colossians, while we were dead and useless in our brokenness, God did not abandon us, but calls us good. God did not look at all we have done and hold it against us and cast us off. Instead, God saw good in this Friday. God made us alive together with Christ. And despite and despite who we are, God forgives us and loves us. This is God's judgment, that forgiveness is coming for you, whether you like it or not. Amen. Please join me in the corporate prayer for repentance. Forgive us, we pray. Remove the sins that distance us from you and from those we love and care about. Remove our selfishness, our pride, our envy, and our greed. Remove from us our thoughtless acts and words that hurt one another. Remove from us the tendency to hurt others out of revenge and anger. Forgive us, please. Create in us a clean heart, O Lord, and renew in us a right spirit. Amen.
A reading from the Apocalypse of John. And I saw heaven opened up, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. He judges and wages war with righteousness. His eyes are like fiery flames, and on his head there are many crowns. He is inscribed with a name that no one understands, except he alone. reading from the Gospel of St. Matthew. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's residence. They gathered the entire cohort together around him, and after they stripped his clothes off, they put a scarlet robe on him. They wove a crown out of thorns, put it on his head, and put a reed as a scepter in his right hand. Then kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed scepter from his hand and began beating him over the head with it. Kings wear crowns, and Jesus, a king, has a crown. Yet here on Good Friday, we are confronted with something grotesque. For the humiliation of the crown of thorns is double, or perhaps better said, it is infinite. In the apocalypse of John, in Revelation, we get a pale glimpse, a sketch of Jesus as he is. Resplendent, powerful, mysterious, kingly. One crown doesn't suffice to communicate his majesty and power. Crowns are heaped upon his head. He is covered with the name of such wonder and power that no one can understand it except he himself. Indeed, he is covered with the name which is above every name, given him by God the Father. This shows Jesus as the rightful ruler of all. This is Jesus as he truly is. The first humiliation of Good Friday is that Jesus has a human crown at all. For what crown could even compare with the heaps of heavenly crowns that ought to grace his head? What mere gold, silver, or jewels are of sufficient worth to endow the head of their creator with beauty and majesty. For Jesus to be crowned king at all is a measure of humiliation. Hear the words of the church father, St. Augustine. What great thing was it to the king of the ages to become the king of humanity? For Christ was not the king of Israel, so that he might exact a tax or equip an army with weaponry and visibly vanquish an enemy. He was the king of Israel in that he rules minds, in that he gives counsel for eternity, in that he leads into the kingdom of heaven for those who believe, hope, and love. It is, a condes- it is condescension, not an advancement. For one who is the Son of God, equal to the Father, the Word through whom all things were made, to become king of Israel. It is an indication of pity, not an increase in power. Unlike the king of England or Rome or Spain, Jesus does not gain power and prestige by becoming a king here on earth. Yet the humiliation runs so much deeper. For the crown that Jesus is given on Good Friday is one of mockery. An insincere crown. A crown, rather, which is sincere in its aim to hurt, to mock, and to maim. In fact, it represents the best crown that humanity can give to the Lord on our own. For since Adam and Eve turned into sin, all people have rejected God as king. The most honest crown that we are able to give Jesus is one of mockery and pain, a crown of rejection. 
above Jesus' head on the cross hangs a sign. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And he is crowned as a king. The Roman soldiers, the overlords of Israel, they've given him a crown. And not only a crown, but robes and a scepter. In this crown, they give pain and they mock Jesus. And they mock the people of God who are looking with hope for God's king coming into the world to rescue them. A crown for a king. Thorns. A king whose throne is a cross to which he is held by with nails. Let us never minimize how grotesque it is for the king of the universe to be nailed to a cross and crowned with thorns. As our hearts yearn for deliverance and our eyes look forward to Easter, we must remember to pause on this Good Friday and that in order for it to be good, it first had to be terrible. That Jesus took the crown of humiliation, the crown of mockery, in order to win a way back, a way back to God for the very people who had turned away and who could offer, at best, a crown of thorns. you turn to the next page in your bulletin, will you please join me in the corporate prayer for longing. Today, he who hung the earth upon the waters is hung upon the cross. He who is king of the angels is arrayed in a crown of thorns. 
He who wraps the heavens in clouds is wrapped in the purple of mockery. He who is Jordan set Adam free receives blows upon his face. The bridegroom of the church is transfixed with nails. The son of a virgin pierced with a spear. We vignette the passion, O Christ. Show us thy, gl thy glorious resurrection. Our closing scripture comes from Matthew 27, 57 to 61. Here we have the account of the burial of Jesus. And please take note of some of the similarities in this scripture as his entrance into the earth in a manger in, in a stable. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to that tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Go in peace.